So I want to think with you guys a little bit about the Daniel work, how you're supposed to read the book of Daniel, how it's been designed to help you understand all of the symbols and imagery in the book. There we go. Can everyone see that? Give me a thumbs up if you can see that. My awesome dagger. All right, so this is the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel is divided in the two parts. Uh, there are many different ways to think about how Daniel is structured, but let's just think of it as two parts for now. Chapters 1 through 6 and 7 through 12. What do you have mostly in chapters 1 through 6? You mostly have stories, right? You have narratives about Daniel and his friends and how they got captured by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and then the Babylonians are eventually replaced by the Medes and the Persians at the end of these stories. So you have narratives in the first six chapters, mostly narratives. You have a couple, uh, you have one vision in there. And then in seven through 12, the second half of the book, you have visions, right? Daniel has all of these visions beginning in chapter seven with all these crazy beasts, right? Um, hybrid animals that have many different kinds of parts for each one. So you have narratives and you have visions in the book. And that's how Daniel divides into two halves. So the first half of the book is really about the past, the days of Daniel and his friends, the days of the Babylonian Empire and the fall of the Babylonian Empire and the rise of the Persians and the Medes. That's the first half of the book. It's about the past. The second half of the book is about the future, all right? That's why you have all of these visions beginning in chapter seven. So the second half is about the future. Now, there are all sorts of interesting features if you compare the first and second half of the book that kind of raise an eyebrow and make you ask, what are you supposed to do with this? For example, the first half of the book, the first chapter, is written in Hebrew. So that's H for Hebrew. <laughs> the first chapter is written in Hebrew. Whereas following that, the next five chapters are written in Aramaic, which is the sort of trade language of the Neo Assyrian or Neo Babylonian Empire back way back then. So you have one in Hebrew followed by five in Aramaic. Okay? Well, can you guess what's going to happen in the second half of the book? The first chapter in the second half of the book, so chapter seven, is written in Aramaic. You get one chapter of Aramaic. Guess what that's followed by? Can you see the pattern? First half is one chapter of Hebrew followed by five in Aramaic. The second half is one chapter of Aramaic followed by five chapters in Hebrew, right? So chapters eight through 12. So the second half of the book is the opposite of the first half of the book in terms of its language. There are other differences where the first half of the book gets flipped on its head in the second half of the book. So for example, Daniel, in the first half of the book, this is our friend Daniel, he interprets, he interprets the vision for Nebuchadnezzar and he interprets the writing on the wall for Darius. These foreign kings don't know what these visions and writing mean. And they need someone to interpret it. And Daniel's the man for the job. Well, in the second half of the book, Daniel is the one who needs to have the dreams interpreted and the visions interpreted for him. So Daniel receives the visions and then needs an interpreter. So Daniel's role gets flipped on its head in the second half of the book in comparison to the first half. Are you guys with me? Give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. Hebrew, five Aramaic, one Aramaic, five Hebrew. Daniel interprets the visions for the kings. Second half of the book, Daniel needs the visions interpreted for himself because he can't do it now. All right. First half of the book is about the past. The second half of the book is about the future. First half of the book has narratives and stories about Daniel and his friends in the time of the Babylonian Empire and the uh, Median and Persian Empire. And then the second half are visions Daniel has about days beyond his own. Okay past and the future first half of the book the second the first half of the book is about the kingdoms kingdoms of man beginning with nebuchadnezzar this is the giant statue that he sees in his dream the head of gold and chest chest of silver and bronze and down to iron first half of the book is stories about 
the kingdoms of man. The second half are visions of the future about the kingdom of God. So man, human beings versus God, past versus the future. Okay? So obviously, as readers of the book, we're supposed to compare the second half of the book to the first half of the book, right? Clearly, it's set up that way. You're supposed to be thinking about the first half of the book, the narratives about Daniel and his friends. When you're reading the second half of the book, the visions that Daniel has about the future. Okay? Why are we supposed to do that? Why does the author of the book of Daniel want us to compare the future in these visions with the past in the days of Daniel? Clearly, the author of the book wants us to compare the future with the past. And then the question you have to ask is why? And the answer is, I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure. How's that? Is 99% pretty good? 99% sure that the reason you're supposed to compare the future with the past in the book of Daniel is that the past teaches something about the future. The lessons of the past will be true in the future. So in the first half of the book, you have these two stories that, uh, about how Daniel and his friends are persecuted by these kingdoms of man. In the first story, Daniel's three friends refuse to bow down to the giant golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar makes of himself. And so what happens to Daniel's three friends? They're thrown into a furnace, right? And then an angel comes and saves them out of the furnace. Well, in that story, it says that the furnace is heated how many times hotter than normal? One time hotter than normal? Two times? Three? Four? Five? Six? Seven times, because that's a good biblical number. Seven times hotter than normal. The furnace. Oh, I should use red for the furnace. Um, they're thrown in the furnace. That's the fire there. And it's heated seven times hotter. But God saves them from the hands of men who would kill them for their faithfulness to God by throwing them in a furnace. God saves them from Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, from the fiery furnace. Well, the other story on the other side, uh, after the Babylonian kingdom falls in Daniel chapter 6, and Darius the Mede takes over the kingdoms of men, is the story about Daniel, who preyed on his roof three times a day, which is uh, great, except for the fact that Darius, the Median king, made a decree that everybody should only pray to him, sort of like Nebuchadnezzar making a statue saying of gold, you should only worship me as God. Well, Darius made a decree saying you should only pray to me as your God, right? What's similar in both of those cases? In both of those cases, the human ruler wants to take God's place, right? And Daniel's friends refused to allow the human ruler to take God's place. So they are thrown into the fire, but God saved them. In the story of Daniel and Darius, Daniel refused to pray to Darius, the human king, and instead prayed to God three times a day as he had always done. So what happens to Daniel? Daniel's thrown into a pit filled with lions. All right? You can tell me if my lion drawing here and a little lion tail. It's got big teeth. All right? Daniel's thrown into the lion's den and saved. Darius comes back the next day and Daniel is saved. And like Nebuchadnezzar, Darius um, has a little poem about the kingdom of God, how God's kingdom is eternal and how God gives life and all the rest of it. So those are the stories about the past in the first half of the book. Those are stories about the days of Daniel and his friends and how God saved them from the kingdoms of uh, men. Um, Oh, I should also say that uh, Daniel in in the day in this story uh, comes into a position of prominence when Darius takes over after sixty two years at the age of sixty two, and then Daniel is thrown uh, into the lion's den. Uh, 
Okay. Well, in the future, you get this vision in chapter seven of all of these, these four beasts, and the last one has all these horns and stuff. Um, and these are the kingdoms of the world. Now the symbolism is of the kingdoms of the world being like ravenous animals rather than a giant statue of a human being, right? As it was with Nebuchadnezzar. We can talk about why it switches from a statue of a man to represent human kingdoms to, in chapter 7, uh, images of these different beasts, now no longer a man, but a bunch of ravenous, dangerous beasts. At any rate, in chapter 7, Daniel has this vision about these four beasts who will rise. And the first one, it says, was like a lion and had wings of an eagle and a heart of a man was given to it. What does that description sound like? It sounds like the stories that you just read about Daniel and his friends. So it was like a lion. Daniel was thrown into the den of the lions. Oh, that's not the right color. It was like a lion. The first beast was like a lion. Well, that sounds like the story of Daniel being thrown into the pit of the lions. It also says that it had the wings of an eagle. Well, that actually sounds like the story of Nebuchadnezzar when God, because of his pride, Nebuchadnezzar made God... Um, gave him the mind of an animal, right? And then after Nebuchadnezzar repents, God gives him the mind of a man back. And um, he also had hair, it says, like the feathers of an eagle. So it sounds like these descriptions of these beasts in this vision of the future in Daniel 7 draw on the stories about Daniel and his friends earlier in the book. So just as God saved Daniel, from the pit of the lions, God will save the one like the son of man from these ravenous nations in the future that are like lions. You see that? So just as it was in the past, so it will be in the future. Okay? Um, interestingly, if you look at chapter 9, you know, that chapter where Daniel prays that God would restore the kingdom. And then Gabriel comes and explains that the kingdom is not going to be restored uh, for another period of time. He's reading Jeremiah and he thinks, oh, 70 years and it's going to be restored. This is Daniel 9. What does Gabriel tell him? Gabriel tells him it's going to be 70 times 7. And then the kingdom will re be restored. So just as the furnace was heated seven times hotter, so the punishment or suffering of Israel will be seven times longer, right? What does it say will happen uh, to the one who's anointed in Daniel 9? The anointed one, the Mashiach? It says that he will be cut off. How many uh, weeks of years will there be until he is cut off? 62. So 62 after a period of 62 weeks of years, which is symbolic, the Messiah will be cut off. When was Daniel thrown into the lion's den? When Darius took over at the age of 62. Right? All right, let me stop there and recap. The point is, the story, of, the stories about Daniel and his friends in the past foreshadow what will happen in the future in the visions. The past teaches a lesson about the future. At the beginning of the book, I have the story of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, um, who captures Israel. And then you have the story of Daniel and his three friends. And Daniel is able to interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, who threatens to kill all the wise men. And because Daniel interprets his dream, Nebuchadnezzar gives the kingdom, uh, part of the rule of the kingdom to Daniel, who is called in the story, it says he's an enosh, which is the Aramaic word for man. Daniel is the man who can interpret the dream, and he's given part of the rule in the kingdom of Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel asked Nebuchadnezzar, can my friends have some of the rule? And Nebuchadnezzar grants it. So Daniel uh, gets some of the rule in the kingdom for his friends. Now, that's how the first half of the book begins. The second half of the book begins with the in chapter seven with um, these four crazy beasts. And then the uh, throne room is set up and the books are open, the court is set up 
And there's one there like the Ancient of Days, who is God. Um, one like the Ancient of Days, who's sitting on his throne, obviously, as the king of kings, right? God. And then a figure shows up who is called one like the son of man. In contrast to all the other kingdoms that are like animals, one shows up in chapter seven. He's called one like the son of man. One like the son of man. This is going to happen in the days beyond Daniel and his friends. There will be one like the son of man and God will give the kingdom to the one like the son of man, the rule. There are also uh, the saints of the most high in this chapter, in chapter seven. Um, and it looks like they get some of the rule as well. So just like the beginning of the book, you have Nebuchadnezzar passing the rule on to Daniel and Daniel gets some for his friends. So in the future, God will pass the rule on to one like the son of man and to the saints of the most high. So again, it looks like the stories are designed to foreshadow the future that you have in the visions, okay? That's just another example of that. Now, if you, in our last four minutes, if you fast forward to the New Testament, who's the, who's the son of man? Who's the one like the son of man? That's Jesus. The New Testament says Jesus is the son of man. And when they say that, they're referring back to this vision that Daniel has in Daniel chapter 7, right? Um, so in the book of Daniel, Daniel, the character, foreshadows the one like the son of man. And in the New Testament, the one like the Son of Man is identified as Jesus. So Daniel prefigures Jesus because he prefigures the one like the Son of Man, who is Jesus. Does that make sense? So the stories about Daniel and his friends prefigure the story about Jesus in the New Testament. It prefigures the story about Jesus in the New Testament. Um, and I'll just give you one example of this. Uh, this is Daniel 5 and 6 that I'll just summarize really quick. Um, Darius, is, uh, Mede, the king of the Medes, um, says, Daniel, if you can interpret this dream, I will give you some of the rule of my kingdom. And I will give you a chain and a, and a cloak and all of this stuff. And so Daniel interprets it, many, many type of parson, what I said. And um, then at Belsh sorry, Belshazzar said this, Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. Right? He's clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Right? So he's exalted to a position of rule that's symbolized by a gold chain and a purple robe. And then Belshazzar dies and Darius takes over. And Daniel, because of his faithfulness, is thrown into the lion's den to die. Um, Darius, the king of the Medes, uh, who has Daniel thrown into the lion's den, doesn't actually want to throw Daniel in there. He's trapped by his advisors. He's reluctant to give Daniel up to death at the hands or the mouths of the lions. But he has to do it because that's what they decree. Um, and they throw Daniel into the pit. And it says they rolled a stone over the entrance. And they placed a seal on it until the morning. And Darius came in the morning and they rolled the stone away and looked. And there was Daniel, not dead, but alive. Right? And Darius... For Darius, this is a lesson about God's kingdom, that he is a living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Now, remember what I just said. Daniel prefigures the son of man, who is Jesus in the New Testament. So if you go to Daniel, uh, Matthew 27, 
this is where Jesus is betrayed in Matthew by Judas. And if you remember the story, Pontius Pilate doesn't really want to crucify Jesus. He tries to get Jesus off the hook. He's reluctant, you know, by saying, hey, what about this other guy, Barabbas? And the people say, no, we want Jesus crucified, right? So like Darius in the days of Daniel, Pontius Pilate is reluctant to have Jesus crucified. Darius was reluctant to have Daniel thrown to the lions. Nevertheless, the people want Jesus crucified. So he's handed over and he is humiliated. And it says in, in Matthew 27, 27, the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head and they put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail the king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him in the head um, and so on and so forth. So just as Daniel was exalted to a position of rule by a Gentile king and given a robe, so Jesus is mockingly exalted to a position of rule, hail king of the Jews and given a robe. In both cases, the Gentile king is reluctant to hand them over, but does. Well, you know the story, Jesus is crucified. And after he's dead, what do they do with his body? They burn it? No, they don't. They put it in a hole in the rock. And what do they do? They roll a stone over the entrance. And they take a seal, just as in the story of Daniel in the lion's den, they rolled the stone over the entrance and they placed the seal on it. Right? So what happens when they roll the stone back away? Jesus, he's alive, not crucified, not dead, just as Daniel was. All right, so let me recap. Daniel, the story of Daniel and the story of Jesus. Both cases, a hesitant ruler hands them over to death. In both cases, they are exalted to a position of rule with a robe. In the case of Jesus, this is obviously done mockingly. Um, in both cases, they are given over to death, thrown to the lions, um, crucified. Um, in both cases, a rock is rolled over the entrance to the tomb with the seal placed on it. And in both cases, uh, God delivers them, delivers Daniel from the lions and delivers Jesus from death after he's crucified. Jesus, who the New Testament says is the son of man. That's what Daniel 7 is about, the Son of Man being given the kingdom of God. And Daniel, the character in the book, prefigures the Son of Man, prefigures Jesus. All right, Yanjay. Ethan, fifth grade, asks, when does the stone, which is from Daniel chapter 2, come? Or Jake asks, why does God uh, choose Daniel? Why? So... Let's just start with these two questions. What do you think? When does the stone come? This is the uh, time, times, and half a time in the book of Daniel. This is um, one, two, three, plus four, and on the fourth one, it's a half. This is what the end of the book says. The kingdom of God will come in at the end. Time, times, time, two times, and half a time. Um, and in the case of vision in chapter two, it's a giant statue that's made of um, gold at the head, silver, bronze, so time, two times, and then iron that is mixed with clay. So it's divided like a half a ton. And then that rock comes and it strikes the feet and it breaks it because it's brittle and that breaks the whole statue. And that rock grows into the kingdom of God. Um, that's the son of man of chapter 7. Who comes and replaces the fourth beast. So 1, 2, 3, 4 is replaced by the rock. 1, 2, 3, 
four is replaced by the one like the Son of Man, and that's Jesus in the New Testament, the one like the Son of Man, the Rock. Um, so that's why Jesus shows up in the Gospel saying the kingdom of God is at hand. And he had to submit himself to death to receive all authority on heaven and earth. So that's, that's I think, how uh, the New Testament would answer that. How's that, Yonde? Okay, then what do you think? Why, why does God choose Daniel? There are many other boys, Jewish boys, but why Daniel? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so Daniel uh, is... It says that he is from uh, the royal state of Judah in Daniel chapter 1. Why is that important? Because the rulership is promised to Judah. David, King David is from the line of Judah. Jesus is from the line of David and Judah. God made a promise to Judah in Genesis 49. And to David, who is from Judah, in 2 Samuel 7, that the kingdom would not depart from his descendants. So Daniel is from that royal line of Judah. And Daniel, that's important because Daniel prefigures the one like the Son of Man, who is Jesus, who is from Judah and from David. That's how I would answer that. Uh, I'm sure there's some other reasons, but... Um, there's, there's also a play on the, the Aramaic, uh, or the name of Daniel, um, uh, and the vision in chapter 7 where the court is set to render judgment, which is a play on the name of Daniel. Um, yeah, so Daniel prefigures that judgment that God will render in the world uh, when the kingdom passes from the kingdoms of men to the kingdom of God question is really interesting. Why were kingdoms interpreted using either metals, four different metals, or beasts? What do you think? So just to get to the question about the beasts, which I think I understand a little bit better than the one about the metals. Um, uh, where are we at here? Um, uh, it's, it's really clear that you're supposed to compare Daniel 2 with Daniel 7. Um, which I talked about just briefly just now. Um, and Daniel 2 is, uh, it's it's an image of, this is not very imposing, but <laughs> of a man. Um, and it says it's the Salem, basically. But the Aramaic, that's the Hebrew, it's the Aramaic of that, which is an image. Um, that's always translated usually as, as uh, how is that translated actually, um, like a statue or something. But you can also translate it image. This is, this is the um, word that's used in Genesis chapter 1, I think 27, 26, 27 or somewhere around there. And it says in Genesis 1 that God created man, Adam, in his image, male and female, he created them. It says that human beings are made in God's image. It's the same word that's used here uh, with this statue in Daniel 2. And what, is it, what does that mean? It means in Genesis 1 that God gives the human beings rule over all of the animals on earth. This is the Bible, how the, this is you know, the Bible is saying this is why human beings are sort of on the top in the animal kingdom. Because humans are made in God's image to rule over the animals. Right? That's Genesis 1. Well, what's going on here with this vision that Nebuchadnezzar has in Daniel chapter 2 is a, a giant salem of a man um, that rules and rules over the kingdoms of the world, but even it says rules over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the fish of the sea or whatever, just like Genesis 1. And it, it, it explains uh, um, Daniel explains this vision to Nebuchadnezzar and you're the head of gold and uh, um, I don't know what, what were the other ones uh, 
then it's going to be followed by silver. And uh, am I getting this right? Bronze? I don't know if these are, if they, my color scheme is very good here. And then iron mixed with clay. So you get four, right? And it begins with Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and it goes all the way through these other kingdoms. So it's the, it's the kingdom that God has given to Nebuchadnezzar and these other nations. And they are like Adam in Genesis 1. The ones that God gives you, the image of God, the image of the statue. Um, in the middle of Daniel, you have this funny story where Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he's arrogant and proud, and so God um, gives him the mind of an animal. Um, I don't know, this is Nebuchadnezzar, he lost his crown or whatever, and um, he's got the mind of an animal, <laughs> and he eats the herbage of the field or whatever, but then he repents and God restores him to his rule. Right? So that story is about how God has taken the one that he gave the rule to, Nebuchadnezzar, the image, and took the rule away from him and, and made him like an animal. So you rule over the animals, you become an animal because of your pride. And when you repent, you're exalted back to your position of rule. This is all playing on Genesis 1, right? Um, so, the vision Daniel has in chapter 7 is of, uh, I can't remember all the details, but four beasts, right? One's like a lion, and uh, I don't know, one's like something else. You get four of these things. Um, so, just as you have two, three, four materials, you have one, two, three, four beasts. And then, in this case, uh, the rock comes and strikes the foot and shatters the statue and the rock rose into a mountain and becomes the kingdom of God. Why a rock? Probably because this is an allusion back to the story of David who defeated Goliath, this giant uh, Philistine with a rock. And David ruled on behalf of God, right? And God promised David to rule. So that's probably why you get the image of a rock there. The, the reason you get the image of a giant salem or image is because it's referring back to Genesis 1 where God creates a human being in his image to rule, right? And then now Nebuchadnezzar is like that. But then how do you explain the movement from the one, two, three, four metals of this statue or image of a man to the one, two, three, four animals? which is talking about the same thing, right? Why does it go from an Im image of a man to that of animals? When it's talking about the same thing, right? You see the question? Why use man in one and then animals in the other, right? Interestingly, in, in Daniel 7, these, these are all, all these kingdoms are represented as animals. I don't know, that's like a skinny cow or something. And, there's no cow in there, but uh, one of them has wings and so on and so forth. These are all like animals, it says, and then it says one like son of man. So it's like the kingdoms of the world turn into animals, just like Nebuchadnezzar was turned into an animal. Or not turned into an animal, but given the mind of an animal, right? And who rules over the animals in the Bible? Adam. Man. So we're waiting for one like the Son of Man to come and rule over the kingdoms of the world which have become like animals. Right? Violent beasts. We're waiting for the one like the Son of Man. Like the animals, like the Son of Man. Contrast. Right? God demotes people. God gives them the rule, and then when they're arrogant and proud, God demotes them. And the way that Jesus gets the rule, the kingdom of God, is by humbling himself to death. Not by being proud and exalting himself over others, but by humbling himself to the will of the Father to death. And then God gives him the kingdom, Jesus, 
the one like the Son of Man, to rule over us because we're the wild beasts. We're the ones who, who create war and violence in the world, right? This is what it means to say Jesus is our king. Not Nebuchadnezzar or Trump or Biden or whoever, but Jesus is our king, right? The, son, the one like the son of man. Hopefully we can right. see you next time. Yeah, thank you guys. Good, good, good luck. And I thought it was like really cool how Daniel 1 through 6 and then Daniel 7, 12, they were like flipped on their, on like, as he said, on their heads. Yeah, like it was mirror image. For me, I already knew there were similarities between 1 through uh, the 6 and 7 through 12, but two other things was um, about the fire, how mm -hmm. it was seven times greater or hotter, and then um, the years the Jewish people had to serve as their punishment. And, um, sorry, I forgot what else I was going to say yeah. about, about those. Um, I thought it was cool how it was one language and then five chapters of another language and then a mm -hmm. switch. But isn't that what Lois said? Yeah. I think it's really interesting uh, about the, the lions then and mm -hmm. Jesus' tomb, or, and uh, being, I never even noticed it mm -hmm. until you mentioned it, and I thought that was like the most interesting part. I loved how that um, he talked about how the past taught something about the future, and also that um, that Daniel was like like pointing to like God, and he's like somewhat similar to him. So yeah, I like that. Interesting, like how. Uh, how the visions that Daniel was given from God literally was the New Testament. It told basically what like, maybe like what Isaiah prophesied. Mm -hmm. Spoke. So I thought it was interesting. I found it interesting how Daniel went from interpreting and praying to God um, to I mean, and he went from interpreting other visions to now he meets interpreting but then like they all think to asking God about it. Uh, what I found interesting was how the stone uh, is represented by Jesus because of how uh, Daniel and uh, Daniel killed Goliath with just a stone. And is that um, with faith in God nothing no humans can harm you even regardless even if they're the most powerful nation. Amen. Interesting yeah. to me how what happens to Daniel would happen to Jesus, like the Daniel getting exalted and then getting the robe, and Jesus would get exalted mockingly and still get the robe. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I liked how there were so many like overlaps between Daniel and the New Testament and how it all clicked together nicely with all those examples. So I thought that was neat. Um, like, I just kind of thought that how it was, how it was, that God, could, like, the angel, can just, like, easily take care of the lions in the lion's den with Daniel. And, like, I just thought, I, just, I also thought how it was cool that, like, everything led to Jesus from the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay, Ethan? I guess I thought that it was cool that the... Old Testament has a lot of relations to the New Testament, such as Daniel getting the cha the um, purple robes and God getting purple robes. Good. Okay, Jay, I'm back to you. Stone represents Jesus. And it, huh. and it foreshadows. I think somebody already talked about this, but I thought the I didn't know about the fire. Mm -hmm. That it was like the it was the same times hotter before. So I thought that was like really interesting. All right. Uh, I interesting about why God chose the Daniel. <laughs> you even got him to t uh to come here in the first place, and that was really cool. It's really cool how like you e you knew him, and then like you actually like like uh that you got him to go into the Zoom meeting and like tell us about things because like. Isn't he like really 
Isn't he like sort of famous? Honestly, uh, it was just cool how like he came into the room like and then like he explained all the uh what I like to uh you know, he answered my question. And David and the stone that hit uh -huh. um the ankle uh mm -hmm. for we could say ankle. The hit this hit the statue. I never knew that. I knew all these connections about like where, you know, Jesus and you know, this Jesus being struck mm -hmm. with a spear and water came out. Mm -hmm. And the stone in the wilderness, Moses struck, water came out. There's a connection there too. Right. And then there's the um Oh yeah, another thing I found out today was the seven times hotter. Mm -hmm. The furnace was seven times hotter. Um, was made seven times harder for Daniel's friends, but also the Israelites would also suffer seven times harder. That was some more connections I really found interesting today. I really liked them.